Well, good morning. Good to see you guys. I've never had a full sweat right before speaking. I've had a partial sweat, but this was a full thing. I, I did something I've never done in all the years of playing drums. I somehow hit myself in the pinky with the end of the drumstick while I was playing. I have no idea. I felt it. I was like, oh boy. So, I luckily, luckily I did. I don't think I yelped. Did you hear a yelp over there? Oh, oh. So today we're going to talk about the giants in your life. And Rodney gave my first illustration, and uh, he knows more about submarines than anybody in church. And what I was going to say about that sub this week was, you know, the guy had been warned and didn't pay attention. And so what I want to say to you is we're going to talk about fear quite a bit today, and we're going to talk about how the enemy basically, by the way, the enemy does not need to destroy you, he just needs to distract you. And he will primarily do that by what you hear. By the way, we self-talk all the time. Very few people don't talk to themselves. Some of you right now are having a full conversation with yourself. Now, if you answer yourself, they put you in a home. If you talk out loud, you just pretend you have a Bluetooth. Right? Used to be be if you're walking down the street and saw somebody talking out loud, you were like, oh, they're crazy. You know, if you, if, you, if you watch What About Bob as he's going down the street, some guy's talking to himself. If you saw that now, you'd be like, cell phone call. But we all talk to ourselves, and here's the deal. The enemy wants to not only make you afraid, but wants you to feel worthless. And some of you, it only took one voice. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a coach who told you you were not enough or you didn't matter or you're a failure for you to now say that to yourself and it keeps you from being what God wants you to be. The guy in the sub this week should have had healthy fear. Let me show you what healthy fear is. Healthy fear is looking at this ladder and realizing that it was probably built in 1963 without safety standards and realizing you probably should not use this to change light bulbs. By the way, this is in the church closet. You have been warned, so if you get hurt on it, I'm just, it's like a disclaimer. I'm a little bit afraid of heights. How many of you are afraid of heights? God created me short for a reason. Stay real low. By the way, the Bible says, low, I'm with you always. So tall people, he's only with you sometimes. No, I'm just kidding. It's, just, it's terrible, isn't it? I got lots of short things. I can. Shortest guy in the Bible, Nehemiah. You know that one? So, but there's a, that was really bad. I heard the groan. It just went across. I should have used that on Father's Day, I guess. It just went across the, oh, that was bad. <laughs> so when we look at the story of David and Goliath, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever heard the story of David and Goliath, right? You all have, right? I mean, you don't even have to be a Christian. You don't have to even be religious of any kind. And you will hear, if you watch sports, you will hear of David and Goliath when, you know, when Miami gets to the finals, which they did this year with mostly, like, undrafted recruits and I mean you know and then they take on the LA Lakers who have 40 billion dollars of expense right and David takes on Goliath actually they took on Denver Nuggets thank you for the help so we hear about that even in sports we hear about it when we take on something and yet can I tell you a secret David did not know the end of this story See, we relax when we read it because we know how it ends, but a lot of times we haven't paid attention to the middle. And what I want to do today is talk about how the enemy uses not only fear, but the voice of the enemy to attack you, to keep you from doing what God wants you to accomplish. And for you, that's the giant. Everybody's giant's a little different, by the way. My giant's not the same as yours. The the thing I struggle with is not the same thing that you struggle with, but you struggle with something. And so I may you may come and tell me what your issue is. I know a guy who's a deer hunter. He hunts uh, bear and deer and wild boar, and he will run them down in the woods. And if he sees a spider, he runs out of the room. 
and I laugh at him. Ha ha, spiders don't scare me. The wild boar, now that's a whole different. And so we're all different. And the enemy will use whatever that is to put that giant in your life, to yell at you that you're not worthy, you don't matter, how dare you think you, who do you think you are to do that? You've failed in the past, you've fallen apart, you've gone through a divorce, you've gone through a bankruptcy, you've gone through physical problems, you've dealt with other issues, you struggle in your life, and God is trying to tell you, it's okay, get up, go forward, and the enemy says, no, no, stay down. And so today I want to tell you, wherever you're at and whatever giant you're struggling with, it's okay to get up. And it's okay to look at the enemy in the face and no matter what other people say, hey, even what another pastor says who doesn't follow Scripture, don't let them tell you that you're not worthy to be a minister of the gospel because you are. The Bible calls us all to ministry. So don't think just because you failed or fallen or messed up that God can't use you. He still has a call on your life for you to minister to other people. And by the way, some of the best people that minister to others are people who've struggled and hurt and failed, and God uses their failures and struggles. And by the way, David was one of those, because eventually the enemy found a giant to take him down. Actually, two different times, you know the story of David and Bathsheba, but David also went down one time because he decided to count his troops trying to prove who he was. He was trying to find his significance in the number of people he commanded. Does that sound familiar? You ever look at your bank account and feel less than? Or you ever look at your bank account and feel more than? The enemy knows where you're going to struggle and he's going to send that voice to attack you and that happens in this verse. So here's number one. Giants bring discouragement and fear. And we're going to look at this Old Testament, 1 Samuel 17, where, by the way, it's kind of a cool story because David was most likely around 17 years of age, so real easy to remember his age. And here we go. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why don't you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man, have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you'll become our subjects and serve us. Then he said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man, let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. We find out that for 40 days, Goliath did this in the morning and at night. Because what you hear first thing in the morning, what you pay attention to first thing in the morning, what you pay attention to before you go to bed is what you'll focus on. And so if you focus on worry, if you wake up and the first thing you do, uh, uh, you turn on the news or the first thing you do is you think about the problem, the situation, the difficulty, the struggle that you have, you're going to focus on that. The enemy is always going to say what Goliath said, which basically is, do you think you can take me on? Who do you think you are? I defy you. Maybe the enemy to you says you're a failure, you're not smart. Who do you think you are? See, one of the things we don't see in this part of the story that I don't have time to go through today is David's actual brother was his distraction. His brother, when he came out, his dad, re remember David had been anointed as king, but his brothers didn't believe it. How do I know that? Because when David came out and started asking questions, his brother said, hey, aren't you a shepherd? you got a few sheep. You should go back to your sheep. And he's like, I was just bringing you guys some cheese and crackers. <laughs> Unappreciative brother, right? And he could have focused on his brothers. But if you read it, he answers his brother a little smart alecky. And then what does he do? He goes back to ask somebody else the same question. He basically ignores his brother. Remember the one that was head and shoulders above the other brothers? And Samuel at first said, that's the one. And God said, nope. Look at his heart. That brother still doesn't believe that David could do it. And by the way, other people in your life may be the giant's voice in your life. 
It could be that there's other people who don't believe in you, that don't believe you can do it, that have told you you're a failure, failure, that have told you to quit, that have told you to get up, give up. And God's reminding you to get up and get going. Don't worry about how big somebody is or how smart they seem to be or how much they have their act together. Even if you feel like a failure, God loves, loves, loves to use what the world considers failures. By the way, if you admit you're a failure, if you recognize you're failing, that's called repentance. When you repent from sin and failure, that's when God says, finally, I can use you. God does not like pride, and so when we think we have our act together, that's when God says, okay, we'll do it on your own. Humble yourselves before him. In 1 Timothy, actually, 2 yeah, Timothy 1.7 says this, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. By the way, this word for timid, this is the only time it's used in the Bible. It means to be a coward. It's exactly what was happening in 1 Samuel. All these people were hiding. They were afraid. I don't blame them. If Andre the Giant showed up in church and said, Eric, I want to wrestle. And, and even worse, by the way, not only was Goliath tall, but back then people were not as tall. Most people would, I would look tall in Israel. Yeah, that should give you. Kevin, where you at? Kevin, we would be tall in Israel. I don't know where he went. All right. In the back. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. This word means miracle giving power or strength. And then it says love. We know what love is. Not the love boat. Love, and then this word is cool, and self-discipline. Self-discipline literally means to be sober, but it means more than being sober. It means to think clearly. Some of you have so let the enemy trick you into thinking that you can't do anything, that you can't minister to anybody, that you can't bless anybody, that you're stuck where you're at, that you can't change, that life will just be the same, that there's no going forward, there's no way to do what God wants you to do, there's no way to make life better, you're just stuck and there, and the enemy has so convinced you of that, you're hiding behind a rock scared. But when you begin to say, God, would you give me your power to think clearly? Give me your power to think clearly. Are there any Marines in here? Now, you can tell me if this story is true. I should have called you, George. So, so... Um, the, the Marines, when they're out, they do some horrible things. They do some things that are not fun. I'm right about that, right, George? Okay. So they do a lot of things that aren't fun. I mean, they have to carry logs. No idea. It's just a matter of their, you know, they just make you miserable. They throw you in cold water. They try to drown you a few times. They're pushing you with sticks. I don't know. I'm making stuff up now. Okay. So all kind of terrible things. And military members will look at each other on these horrible days in the cold rain when they're having to carry out an exercise and they'll look at each other and they'll say full benefit. Is that, you ever heard that? Oh, he said, okay, good. I'm not going to get killed after the service. That's good. All right. They'll say full benefit. And what that means is we're in this together. We know that we're having to go through this horrible thing together, but that's one of the benefits of being in the military. When you begin to do what God calls you to do, when you actually make a difference in the world, the enemy is going to attack you and try to discourage you. And on that day that you're doing just fine, and all of a sudden that wave of regret overwhelms you. You're soundly sleeping in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden your brain decides, let's play greatest hits of my greatest failures. That was dumb. Full benefit. Because when you're a child of the king, the enemy wants you to be discouraged. And one of the benefits, the great benefits of being a child of the king is to recognize when those giants yell at you, they don't have any power over you. That is, those times that you messed up and failed and life fell apart, that is not going to matter in eternity. No matter what you've done, no matter how you've failed, the Bible says when you confess your sins, he is faithful. And we'll forgive you. 
And so what's awesome about that, well, the greatest benefit is, no matter what your failures are, even when the enemy tries to get you to replay them and say, well, see, you don't deserve to do that, you say, yeah, but I'm forgiven. God has forgiven me, and he wants me to get up again, not to stay down. Have you been staying down because the enemy's told you you're a failure, and you should give up and stay right where you're at? I'm going to give you a couple practical things to do. Number two, focus your faith on God and not on your giant. I can remember walking in the bridge in Titusville, and all of a sudden, I'm just walking. It's a beautiful day. I'm just walking. Got my music going. And all of a sudden, just a wave of discouragement. Just, I mean, I could feel it just... Boof. Every wrong thing I ever thought. Every dumb thing I ever did, the time I dropped the cymbals on the stage while the choir was out front singing, enter the stable gently of all the songs for them to be singing. All the wrong things I've said to people, all the times I misspoke, all the times that somebody said something to me and I wish I had had a better comeback, better reaction, that just waved over me all of a sudden. And I was overwhelmed. And sometimes in life, you're going to feel that way, especially the enemy will try to get you to focus on whatever that giant is of failure and regret and sin. And while I was walking, you know what I did? I started saying, you know what, God? Thank you for today. God, thank you for the sun that's shining Thank you for the wind that I can feel on my face. Thank you for the birds. Dave, uh, last night, uh, uh, Steve said the birds were chirping at the beach. I said, no, no, no. The birds at the beach were squawking. <laughs> but Lord, thanks for the birds that squawk. Lord, thank you that I can walk over this bridge. Lord, thank you that I have the ability to do this. Thank you that I have the strength to go up the hill. Lord, thank you that I can feel the heat, even though it is hot. Lord, thank you for the humility, because humidity, I'd still rather have that than Arizona. Sorry, sister-in-law. 1 Samuel 17 picks up in verse 28. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him. So you can imagine this dude with a big shield. The, the, the Philistine is there, and they have this huge shield. The poor guy has got to carry this huge shield. Goliath is probably near nine feet tall. He's at least really tall. We don't actually know exactly how tall he is, and that's okay. He kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw he was little more than a boy. Glowing with health and handsome. Once again, he looked like Ed Sheeran. The teenage girls are, oh, oh, David, I never knew. I'm going to read Psalms totally differently now. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? By the way, some people think that he had gigantic, I can't say the word, the, the thing that happens when you're too big, giantism. And so he saw double. That's why he said sticks instead of stick. Maybe. He said, you come at me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. You ever had anybody cuss you out? If you haven't lately, I... Did this week. I can tell you all about it if you want to come see me after. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now David, little David, doesn't back down. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. And he could have said, I come to you with slingshot. Which, by the way, was an advantage. Did you realize that? But the truth is, he didn't care about the slingshot. God didn't need the slingshot. If God wanted to, he could have sucked the giant into the ground. And David knew that. He said, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. That's a pretty big threat. This very day, I'll give the carcasses of the whole army to the birds and the wild animals. Like, you're going to give my carcass? Fine. I'm going to give all your soldiers. All those gathered here will know, will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord says. Why? For the battle is the Lord's 
and he will give you into our hands. Listen, when you're going through life, if you would remember those times where your face feels flushed because you're angry, those times that you're giving in to sin, those times when you're overcome by temptation, those times when you fail and falter or you want to fail and falter, where temptation comes at you, if you will recognize, God, this battle is yours. Now listen, you've got to do your part. You can't just sit back and pray, God, would you just take care of this? There's a proverb that says, the horse is prepared for battle, but the battles belongs to the Lord. Which means the battle's God, but I've got to do my part. So I can't just sit on the couch and say, God, pay my bills for me. That would be awesome, by the way. But you actually have to figure out how to pay them. Maybe that means getting an extra job. Maybe that means being better with your budget. Maybe that means not spending your money on things you shouldn't spend it on. But God, this battle is yours. And Lord, too often I come to the end of the month without enough money. And so help me to get to the end of the month and be able to provide. Lord, would you show me what to do? The battle is yours. Lord, I'm struggling with discouragement, and it might be mental health, and it might be a chemical imbalance, but Lord, no matter what it is, I'll do what you've called me to do, but the battle is yours. So would you guide me into what I should do as I overcome this giant in my life? I love this, Hebrews 13, 6. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And in English, it doesn't pick up on the subtlety of this verse because it says, because helper in this version, in this verse in Greek means runner. And here where it says afraid, it means to run. And so it's the Lord is my runner. I will not run. God, you're my helper. You're the one who's going to take care of me. You're running for me. So I don't have to run. God, you're running towards the enemy, so I don't have to run. I can just stand in your power. Why? Because God is with you. Max Lucado says, the first thought of the morning, last worry of the night are your Goliath. They dominate your day and infiltrates your joy. You can't minister to other people if you're focused on fear and frustration all day. The time. I want to encourage you to refocus. Look up these verses. I'm going to give you a, a few verses. Ephesians 2 5, I am alive with Christ. Romans 8 2, I'm free from the law of sin and death. Isaiah 54 14, I'm far from oppression. I will not live in fear. 1 Corinthians 2 16, I have the mind of Christ. Some of you need this one. Philippians 4 7, I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And one of my favorites, 1 John 4, 4, the Spirit of God is greater than the enemy in the world, and He lives in me. Get some verses that you can focus on. Refocus your mind. Don't focus on what the enemy is doing. Focus on what God is and can do through you. Number three, face the giants with His strength. You ever have anybody tell a lie about you? And you either heard about it or caught them? I got to listen to somebody lie about me this week. It was so much fun to have to listen to. Because instantly I want to say, that's not right. And I remember years ago calling one of my friends, Rudy Moberg, and I was telling him about somebody who was lying about me. I said, this person is lying about me, and people are believing it, and it's just not true. And he goes, Eric, I know it's not your true. Your friends know it's not true. He said, but truthfully, is that the worst thing you've ever thought? No. What if they actually knew your thoughts? Oh, that would be bad. <laughs> Sometimes we're focused on the giant, not realizing that God is giving us victory every day over the very things that we're dealing with. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. By the way, sometimes when life is tough, just get it over with. When you have something hard to do, they say sometimes just go do it. Do the hard thing first. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. By the way, he had five stones, probably about the size of cue balls. How'd you like a cue ball to hit you in the head? I've been hit in the head with a bowling ball by a Boy Scout. Doesn't feel good. The stone, what did he do? 
He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. He fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone without a sword in the hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. And by the way, David took that sword and hung it on his wall. And the rest of his life, no matter where he was, he had that sword hanging up to remind him that God helped him to overcome. What in your life hangs up that you can look back at and say, God helped me overcome that. I know that God is going to help me to overcome the next thing. Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. That means daddy. Too often we think of God as putting up with us. But the truth is that God absolutely loves you. God is a good father who cares more about you. you. may have had the most loving father in the world. You may have had a terrible dad. I don't know which one you had, but no matter how wonderful and awesome your dad was, nowhere near as good as God is. And yet the Bible says you can cry out to him as your father. What's your giant? What's the enemy lying to you about? What's the full benefit of you trying to live the Christian life today? I want to encourage you. Surrender whatever that giant is to him. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. I got some drums to play and you have some money to give. And so uh, we'll do that part and sing a great song. But after the service, I'll be here. And if you want to give your life to Christ, you can come and say, Eric, I want to surrender my life to Jesus knowing he died and rose again, knowing I'm messed up. I'm a sinner. I'm broken and I need forgiveness. And God can do that today. Maybe you're here today and there's been a giant in your life. I want you to just imagine yourself taking whoever or whatever that is before God and saying, God, this is your battle. Help me to overcome because my strength is in you. Let's close in prayer today. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. Lord, I pray Father, I know there's people in here that have giants of discouragement. Some have giants of depression. Others have giants of just negative things that have been said to them their whole lives. Some have dealt with struggle and hurt. And it's the giant in their life that's just overshadowing them. Lord, right now, would you give them your strength? Lord, right now, would you let them know your presence? Father, would you let them know that you are Abba, Father, who loves them right where they are, that they would know that in Jesus' name. Amen. You have our time.